welcome to uh, our first Friday uh, that's actually on the second Friday this month, but uh, because of the fourth. But uh, we're glad to have everybody here. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, or welcome Steve back, and he'll introduce the program. So here's Steve Gustafson. On behalf of McPherson College, good afternoon and welcome. It's great to see you here. It's even better to see that you read the Village News and your refrigerator magnet to know that we moved our meeting from last week to, to this. Next month, Rick Tyler is going to be our presenter. Anything and everything you wanted to know about theater. He will be glad to respond, so don't be afraid to put him on the spot. This afternoon, I am delighted to welcome Professor Kerry Dobbins. Kerry is a fairly recent addition to our Department of History and Politics at McPherson College. During her time with us, she has developed an activity that has really enthused a number of students in her classes. She uses games as a method for teaching history. And uh, Doris, we're going to ask you to join one of the other tables of your choosing because this is going to be a group activity where you have opportunity to work together. I'm going to turn the mic over to Carrie at this time with, and one further thing. Uh, Elsie pointed out in the Village News that because we're going to play a game this afternoon, we're going to go past our one hour time frame, but we will be done by 3.30 this afternoon. Just wanted to give you a heads up there. So, Carrie, welcome, and thank you for presenting this afternoon. So let me give you a little bit of background myself. As Steve mentioned, my name is Carrie Dobbins, and I came to McPherson College about five years ago. And I have, uh, have a freshly minted, it's getting a little older now, a freshly minted PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is where I was before I came here and was there for about 10 years. My research is in early modern English history. So I actually study the British side of the American Revolution. So I, when I teach this particular class, um, my take on it is a little bit different about a, maybe some gentlemen who maybe sort of just been quiet and actually paid their taxes and stopped complaining so much. But sometimes students aren't quite used to hearing that story, from, especially from high school. So I'm trying to be good and use the rules that I give my students, which is always bring notes. Make sure that you have everything ready so you know when you're talking. So I think actually you'd be a little bit more excited about the guests that I brought than myself because I wanted to, uh, so James Colville is a junior, he just wait for it now, he's gonna help us out. Um, he's a junior, he's a, um, a uh, political history major. Um, James Bigger is, oh, sorry, Justin Bigger, sees James, it's not the J's, I'm only allowed to have J students I guess. Um, and he actually worked with Steve, and he is a theater uh, performance major, but he was also involved in these classes, and so he's here to help me out. Also, a friend of mine, uh, Justin Keir, is here visiting from Wisconsin, and he's been part of game design with me for a number of years, and he said, well, I'll come help out too, So, because who doesn't want to play a game? So, so let me give you a little bit of a background to what we're doing today. So. There's a, there's a major problem when teaching history, right? Let me just, amongst the many problems when teaching history, right? Okay, so keeping them awake, right? That's number one. But there's a couple of things when you come to a college classroom that I'm really worried about. And a lot of times we sort of learn things the wrong way when we're growing up. It's unfortunate. But a lot of times when people come to a history classroom or my history classroom, they're pretty convinced that the, things, the reason things happened the way they did was that they were fated. There was no other way that the events could have happened the way they did. The colonists won the Revolutionary War because that's how it was gonna happen. Well, and you seem to be, uh, you seem a little bit more informed about that. Maybe when you're 18, things seem a little bit more um, faded about the world. I think I'm uh, getting the mic to feedback a little bit. So one of the things that I take as the centerpiece of my job is that I need to teach students that the reason that things happened the way they did was because of the decisions that individuals made. Because that's what mattered. And if individuals in the past had made different decisions, then the outcomes would have been different. 
okay, right? That's pretty, and then we can, we can have a boring lecture on that. So, but I, I, I usually try to avoid that. So in history, we have a couple of ways of understanding that, and I have some two terms that my students are so tired of hearing, so if you want to have an entertaining moment, you can watch um, Justin and James roll their eyes really hard right now as I tell you that the most important concepts in history are, all right, you guys know, what's the first one? You see, and the second one is? Context. There you go, right? See, I don't even have to tell. They see, I've trained them so well. All right, agency is the idea that everyone makes decisions that they think is gonna work out for themselves. Now we all know this because a five-year-old, it doesn't have to be a good idea. A five-year-old wants ice cream for dinner. I think I want ice cream for dinner. That's probably not a good idea. But that's still what I want and I'm still gonna try to get ice cream for dinner. Um, since I'm an adult, I'm gonna have an easier time of a five-year-old. So, but that's agency, so everyone has that. It's also shared in sociology. And context, which is the idea that, m that meanings change in different time periods. There's an understanding of the world that people had in the 1700s that we do not have now. And that changes everything. Context changes everything. So as historians, how do we get away from asking students to memorize names and dates, which I always promise my students I'll never make them do, and they don't. Have I broken the rule yet? Okay, well you're not, gonna, you're not gonna sell me out right here in front of everybody. Um, how do you get people away from memorizing names and dates and how do you get them to understand those core concepts of history of agency and context? And the way that one group came up with was the idea of role immersion games. So this is what their textbook looks like. So it's not super fancy, we have a nice, these are all printed out, I get them printed out and I lend them to the students so they don't have to pay any extra money for textbooks. So about 10 years ago, a professor at Columbia University in New York was trying to figure out how to teach, he's a, he's a classicist, he's trying to figure out how to teach ancient Athens, and he, like all other historians, are trying to figure out those, answer those questions, how do you teach agency and context? And so he hit on the idea of, well, why don't I make the students understand the context of being in ancient Athens, and why don't I make them have to make the decisions as if they were ancient Athenians? And from that, a whole series was developed. And the series is called Reacting to the Past. And that's the curriculum that I use in all of my 100 level classes. So it's not a simulation, which you may have heard of. Simulations, the outcomes are set, right? If you do a simulation of a civil, uh, of a Supreme Court case, you're gonna have the same outcome. And it's not anti-historical. Sometimes people get worried when we say the word game they're worried that we're not gonna take this seriously. We take it extremely seriously. So I think if anyone sees any professional athlete on the field, you can see what serious playing is, and my students take it seriously. But we can have an outcome that was different from what actually happened in history, but it could have happened. It was one of the options. So these are long-term, we have to invest a lot of time in them. They usually take between three to five weeks of class time to play. So when students get into them, they get really into them. And actually, if the gentleman would, show, uh, would hold up some blue sheets for us, the blue sheets are character sheets. You're all gonna be getting one of those. And I actually, maybe Kim can attest to this, I have professors tell me, oh, the game has started, haven't they? Uh, they were reading the blue sheet in your class, weren't they? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I keep telling, do, it's rude to read the character sheet in your class, but they just get a little too excited about that. But what the students learn is, what does it mean to make these decisions as historical individuals? Now there's a whole series of games. We have ancient Athens, ancient Rome, the trial of Galileo in Renaissance Italy, labor and women's suffrage in New York City in 1913, which is amazingly popular and uh, Indian independence in 1945. Trust me, the, the student who has to pay, play Gandhi is feeling a little stressed in that game. And of course, American Revolution, which we're gonna be uh, having one debate from today. Games are constantly being developed by other professors, and we also help one another when we're doing that. 
This next weekend, um, James Coble and I will be going to Simpson College in Iowa for the Games Development Conference. There we'll be returning, uh, traveling to 1930s Weimar, Germany. We're gonna be going to Renaissance Italy and fighting over who gets to actually build the dome on the church in Florence. And we're gonna be figuring out what it means. Uh, we're actually debating the legality of homosexuality in the American Psychiatric Association in the 1970s. So James is lucky to get to play Stanley Milgram and I'm really jealous about that, so. Okay, um, so uh, James, Justin, would you like to say a few words before we get started? Oh, okay, come on up. Yeah, yeah. I got the mic. Oh, you got the mic. It's on. You just gotta put it up to your face, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a microphone that amplifies sound. Okay. Um, like Carrie said, my name is Justin Dean Bigger. Um, one thing that's uh, uh, talk about the games. Uh, well, um, I guess one of the questions would be, what surprised you the most? And they're about to play, they're about to have a debate. Yes, yes they are. So, so what, what advice could you give them? Um, okay, so one thing that surprised me about the games themselves is I'm, I'm a pretty prolific game player. I've been playing everything since I was very, very tinier. Um, and one thing that I really enjoyed about the reaction to the past series is that it's, uh, I get to put on a role. You may have come to the theater and seen me do some acty type things. So I generally enjoy to do the acty type thing, um, but this is in an educa another educational application <laughs> that isn't gimmicky. There's a lot of games out there that it's you know, like the Oregon Trail where you're kind of playing it, but it's not really, you're not learning anything. Um, whoever gets to play Delancey is the, pr I played Delancey and he was an English loyalist. And you know, I'm red-blooded American, they lost, ha! And then halfway through the game I realized that actually the English loyalist totally had a completely valid complaint and they were right the entire time. Um, and it was great to take on that, uh, that role and immerse myself in uh, and learn a lot about a subject matter that normally I don't care about. Um, but uh, uh, what was the second part of the question? Okay. All right, well, I mean, we started on a high point. Now we're gonna go down a little bit. <laughs> uh, I really think for, for me, the games offer a certain level of engagement that's impossible through typical like lecture series. Uh, I, I played, I was in the Trial of Galileo, I was the leader of the moderate faction, and we won, because I'm awesome. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got to do fun things like send people to get tortured by the Inquisition and things like that, and I got to, like, force people to elect a pope from my faction. But uh, I think it, I know a lot more about the Trial of Galileo now than I probably should, because... I think I read the rule book like five or six times because it literally it really ticks on a certain level of competition that you don't really get through lecture series. And it really it engages you on a whole nother level where you want to learn about the subject and you want to know more and more because you want to crush everyone else. And that's and now it's my turn again. Um, so you're about to play. Um, we're going to be handing out the blue sheets. Read the blue sheets, read the blue sheets, read the blue sheets, um, and do what they say. Um, they're they're kind of, they give you a little bit about who the person was, what they believed in, and what kind of the, your argument should be. Um, but you get to voice that in your own way. Um, and you get to shape whether or not, uh, I, the debate is about whether or not the colonial army will be, uh, and so you get to decide, do we make a army to fend off the British? And you will be debating that from the perspectives of your characters. Uh, and that's, that's a, I don't wanna make that decision, personally, but as a character, why not? Let's do it. Uh, yes, don't be afraid, um, and just, Yes, and we're gonna be we're gonna be mingling around. We're gonna actually pass out some blue sheets, uh, if you want to. We're gonna be handing out blue sheets, and then you're going to have to get into loyalist, patriot, moderate, women's, labor, and slave. slave. <laughs> um, uh, so you might have to group up into different 
table situations. Are we all okay with that? Fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna have the mic on just for briefly, another minute. So, <clears throat> well, um, James and Justin are gonna be passing out the sheets to you. So what you're gonna get, you're gonna get a unique character sheet. So, and you're, the character name is on top. You are actually a historical person. There's a couple of folks who are composite characters. The slaves are composite characters as best as we can figure them out and do the research. But otherwise, you are actual historical people and there are instructions. Now remember, this is a five week game. So we're doing a single debate. They're also gonna be giving you um, a news report. So to give you the background, it's now August of 1775. We're in New York. Many of you are, you, you're, all of you except uh, the women, the landless laborers, and the slaves are members of the New York Assembly, so the local legislature. If <clears throat> all of you have the right to speak, some nasty things have happened in Massachusetts. It's August, so you've just been hearing some nasty stories about something that happened in April when the British Army, which was occupying Boston, learned of a cache of arms in Concord, and actually went, and this is important for my students, British soldiers shot British citizens. That's what happened. And I always tell them there's this moment to think about it in slow motion, in the like in a movie, when the bullet leaves the gun, you can't get it back again. So what has happened in a society, we talk about this with the American Civil War as well, the minute the bullet leaves the gun in any situation, you can't get it back, but now it is your troops firing upon your citizens. And what does that mean? Because that changes everything, doesn't it? Once that bullet is in the air, and once it's about to hit that person, everything is going to change. So the debate that we're gonna be having is one that we actually have around week two, it's the third, actually week, uh, third week of the game, the Patriots, so those of you who have Patriots on your character sheets, you're going to be responsible for bringing forth a proposal on military training. Do you guys have the white sheets for everybody for the news? Now, if you are a woman or a slave or a landless laborer, this actually matters to you because if you're a woman, if you're the widow, your son might go to war. If you're the other one of the women, it's your husbands who are going to go to war. If you are a slave, is there a way that you can use military service to get yourself freedom? So this all matters to you. Oh, and by the way, because you know, history isn't that far away, how are we gonna pay for all this? So it turns out wars are kind of expensive. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You get a chance to read your character sheet. We'll go for about 15, 20 minutes where you guys can prep. So why don't we have all of the patriots come to, we have, is it a lot of patriots here? Okay, we're going to do Patriots here, and then do we want to do Loyalists here? We have to move around. And then we'll have Moderates in the back middle table. And then anyone who are women, landless laborers, or slaves can come to this corner table here if that would be all right. And I'll help you get sorted out. Washington in Massachusetts has asked for troops. So there's three options. The options are just to have a militia like we have right now. Unfortunately, colonial militias work about like this. On a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon, a bunch of guys go out with their muskets, line up, shoot them once, and then go down to the tavern and get drunk. <laughs> That's what militia training looks like in the 1700s. So, uh, you know, the uh, you know, seals, they're not. <laughs> so, the thing that's kind of the middle of the road would just be to have a New York colony army. That's kind of the middle of the road. Right? It's a little more expensive. The most expensive, but the best trained and the best fighting force would be to send troops to Washington. Except that means they leave the state, and if they leave the state, they can no longer vote this assembly. So that's tough for those folks who have decided they're going to give up that power. So now if you're a landless laborer, would it be helpful for you to actually volunteer for that military if there was one? Because you can get paid and riff around the wing side. Maybe you'll get land out of it. If you're a slave, first of all, these people say they own you. And now are you to like, volunteer to give up your life for them? Besides, you've heard some rumors. 
maybe the British are going to free people. If you, if the slaves of patriots have run away and joined the British army, they'll free you. So maybe that's a better deal. See if the patriots can match that deal. <laughs> right? So you can see about that. And then uh, for the women, of course, your loved ones will be the ones who are going. So I'll give you a chance to take a look at those. And if you feel confused, then it's exactly the way that it's designed. <laughs> 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 There's no doubt about the fact that it's a pup, which I should read. The Patriots have been followed. They have been followed. But she said there's a rumor that the British can free the slaves in the But it's <laughs> You two are so All right, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Now, that, that sense of confusion that you have right now is actually quite normal. Gentlemen, were you confused at the beginning of your game? Absolutely, oh, yeah. Did you have any idea what was going to happen? I had some, little, very tiny. Okay, did it work out? Yeah. Yeah, it worked well, out. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's, there's no stakes. I, I always say to everyone, I don't grade the gameplay. So, I don't have a great book with me, I promise. So just go ahead and enjoy attempting to do your best, right? Because we can never actually become the people in the 1700s, but we can use our historical imagination to do the best we can to understand why they made the decisions they did. And with that, I believe that we may be ready to hear a proposal from the Patriots. And at this point, I just listen to the students. Militia training. Could militia training eventually lead into a professional army? No. No. <laughs> Why not? Washington has asked for the troops now, and he needs a response in a week. Because he's waiting in Massachusetts. Well, I have a 17-year-old son. I'm not going to let him go with this militia. I mean, because if he's going to go because of this dangerous situation, I wouldn't have had really good training because the British Army Militia training might be cheaper, but it's not effective. But how are we going to make these rich folks over here <laughs> give us the money? She's really consumed by the money. <laughs> She's like every politician ever. <laughs> well, yes. We have, we have the best form of government. You can't beat the kind of form of government that we have that we've developed over the years. We're based on the 10 things from Saint, from John, somewhere back there. Uh, charter, there was a charter back there somewhere. It gave us 10 wonderful rights and, and, and it's pretty hard to improve on that. And we've got a system worked out here and it's working pretty well. And, and there's just no reason why we should have to contribute to you to fight against us. That just doesn't make any sense at all. So that's, that would be our argument in front of the court. So, so Sir Judge, what do they call it in England? Lord? <laughs> House of Lords? Uh. <laughs> yes, yes, we do have, we have a lot of private money. We have a lot of private money and I've got a lot of it and I'm gonna use it to what I wanna do. Um, so we had now was we had, we just did one vote and one debate in the class, we would have about a dozen of these. So everything from the very first one is the decision, are you boycotting British made goods? Or are, for example, are you gonna buy tea? I mean, that's an awful lot. That's essentially asking people to go without their coffee, which you may be folks who would have a hard time doing that. So there's that question. This is the question of, the question of what to do about slaves. The question about how to raise taxes. The question of, and actually, you, you, it's interesting because us as 21st century people, I've noticed that we sort of have the same, um, the same places where we have a hard time. The slavery question is really hard. And actually, I appreciated that you did what many of my students do, is you were 18th century people. To think about freeing slaves in 1775 would have been unthinkable. And I have students who talk about how difficult that was. And that's one of the things that they, that they talk about. So um, I'm gonna invite uh, the students back up here. And actually, I'm kind of curious, so what, what was that experience like? What did, how did you feel trying to play those characters and the information that you had in our small, you know, 20 minute example? 
I really wanted to hear Doris argue against the women's right to vote. <laughs> For me, it felt intimidating. Okay, so it's an intimidating experience. Yeah. Who was intimidating about it? I didn't feel like I absorbed what I was yeah. supposed to be. Yeah. Okay. And so, so I guess so you guys can chime in. That, that happens. Um, being a, a passionate game player, um, I basically had to lead the loyalists along by the nose um, and like force them to look at their blue sheets and whenever they had to present because uh, the way that the game is structured is you would come up to a podium like this and be like, I propose that we don't ever smuggle things because smuggling is bad. You would have to do that and have a well-articulated argument. And people that haven't read their blue sheets or don't quite get that uh, well, don't present do, well. Do you think that I don't consider myself to be really creative? Mm -hmm. And so do you see that more creative students like you who do theater, blah, blah, blah. Is it easier for you? Well, you fooled me because you asked excellent questions. Absolutely, yeah. I uh, mean, you, 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 ac you actually asked the questions that you would need to, you know, you were worried. Where was your land? So you actually were doing everything that I would expect a landless laborer character to do. So you had me fooled if you were thinking yourself as non-creative. Uh, I mean, and the trick of theater is to live truthfully under imaginary circumstances. And that's exactly what you did. So the people that, uh, like, I see these big old burly football players getting into why don't they have the right to vote as a woman? <laughs> and it's great. I should, probably, I should probably admit that every single game, every single woman is a man, is played by a male character. And the bigger and burlier, the better. <laughs> Those references in, to things in books that mm -hmm. probably would have been helpful. Yeah, those big red books back yeah, there. If but, I had the background. <laughs> right, but yeah, I can only assign you so much homework. I felt a little guilty assigning you this much. <laughs> if I take this course. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, it's great to have people argue about what Locke really meant by property. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, shall we get one another, no less? Oh, well, that's yes. the most effective form of communication. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, if you've ever seen students argue, it's pretty funny to listen to them argue and then you actually realize they're saying, well, you know, Locke, in the second treatise, he's actually pointing out how you have to mix your labor with the property in order to own it and it exists in the state of nature. And aren't you listening to me? <laughs> I mean, and that is sort of one of that's like, then you know you're succeeding. Like, okay, I'm learning something because I could probably have any students play this game tell me exactly where, how, prop, how property is defined in Locke. They could probably tell me instantly because they've been yelling at each other about it for about three weeks, so. Any questions about, for, for Colville and myself, as, as students that have played several of these games? Yes? Does she pick who gets what part, or is it random? To a certain degree, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, I sort of do half and half. Part of it is I don't know a lot of the students. Uh, so it's a wonder level class, it's the first time I've met them. Um, so a lot of them are freshmen, first time freshmen. I occasionally give projects out, I will admit that. Um, <clears throat> women had never gotten any rights in three years of the American Revolution, and so I picked who I thought was a really strong player. Very tall, uh, he's the, when he graduated, he's the catcher on the baseball team, and I said, Bennett, no one has actually gotten women to vote yet. See if you can do it, and he pulled it off. I sort of gave him that special project. And he would play the widow. The widow is the, usually leads to all the women. Um, so occasionally I'll do that. But I have actually learned to be a little bit careful about that because folks who I think are not very strong students absolutely get electrified by this game. Mm -hmm. I've had students who, you know, the most boring. Classically, it's an athlete because then I say, you can win. I say the magic words <laughs> you can win this. Because there are winners of this game, you get extra points. There's a one point grade bonus, one, which actually we calculated out as like less than 0.0003% of their grade, but man, they'll fight for that point. <laughs> like, so, so you gotta put something on the table for them to really feel like I can get something. But yeah, the classic disengaged athlete will just tear this game apart. Because I've, all of a sudden, I've laid out history 
in a way that they understand. So I've actually seen uh, and a student who pretty much barely showed up to class, and I handed him a character sheet. He was all bummed because he was a slave, and I said, well, you can win. And I saw at the end, he said, okay, everyone, this is how we're going to do this. We're going to be in the library at this time. I want to make sure your papers are on charge. Like, he, was, he organized the entire team. So I try not to sort of guess who's going to be what kind of player. Have you ever had a student, like, fail? Um, get this kind of... Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, we've had one or two who essentially vanishes. Okay. Or so. They just I, don't show up. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know how to. I mean, if any college knew how to make students show up to class, we'd only be making a million bucks, right? So, so, and now I will say, there are some professors who do feel that this is kind of a perfect tool. It's not. There's no such thing as a perfect tool in a classroom, right? It's a tool in a toolbox. So I use this and all these other sort of um, pedagogical theories and tools. So, but it's rare, but occasionally there's a student this does not connect with, so that yeah. is true. But sometimes more so they're just afraid, they're afraid in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They had terror in the beginning. I don't think you had to be terrified. No, because I'm foolish. <laughs> <laughs> Usually the first, this sort of was a perfect first day. Do you know how everyone's kind of feeling very nervous and it's like, I don't know how to, what to do yet. You know, I don't know what to do. And there was a lot of, I actually like having students feel that way. And you guys have, but you know, adults sort of feel this way all the time. But a lot of their lives, they've been given a grid or a sheet or a grading rubric and it says, just check these off and then everything will be fine. Look at your A. I have students who say, how do you win? How do I get an A in this? I don't know. There isn't a cheat sheet for this. There isn't a cliff notes or spark notes for how do I make sure that we um, boycott British goods. <laughs> and there's no, you just have to try. And you have to figure things out. And they're going to have a bunch that mess up. And that teams essentially collapse and then recover again. Just like on any sport field. Deal where you get the first half to be a complete disaster, and the second half they can bring it back. I've had teams do that all the time. Your experience with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, in order for me, I've played the Lancy too. Um, in order for me to accurately debate the Patriots and win over the moderates, I had to learn what the Patriots wanted. So I had to read the stuff that they were reading and then write down arguments against those things that they were reading. And read almost the, the stuff that I was figuring out, and support that, and I give that to my teammates that weren't reading, uh, and basically write their papers for them. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, when I played, it was uh, Trial of Galileo. So I was playing a cardinal, and uh, it was difficult at first. Yeah, like a bird. Okay. <laughs> It was difficult at first because I always thought of myself as someone who's always somewhat scientifically inclined and accurate, and I had to be like, no, science is bad, because it goes against the Bible, so it is bad. So, <laughs> so it was difficult for me to come up with arguments against like, well, obviously the Earth is the center of the universe, guys, come on. And like, no, telescopes don't work, that's ridiculous, it's just magic and toys. But. <laughs> It got easier as it went along because a lot of people sort of went circular in their arguments and it became easier to analyze them and kind of pick them apart and even towards the end kind of steer, pe steer people to what your opinion was to a point where they would go up and give a presentation and be like, oh, so you agree with me then? And they'd be like, well, no, we're this faction. Like, well, you just said what I've been saying this whole game. And, uh, so yeah, it really starts off a lot like you go and you type a two-page speech to give and you stand up there and you're like, well, uh, the Patriot faction would like to start a continental army and this is why. And no one really stands up and says anything because everyone's like, okay, it's our turn to give a speech next. I, I don't want to stand up for it now because everyone's nervous at first, no one knows how it works. But then by the end of it, it's just like, 
yelling, and the amount of backstabbing that goes on is completely absurd. It's like, it's just biblical. <laughs> so, so, fun thing about this game in particular, uh, Delancey has the ability to basically blackmail one of the moderates, and I told them all of the moderates that I would take away their land, therefore they wouldn't have the right to vote, so they better vote with me. So, yeah, so not only do you learn about history, but also political science. <laughs> Uh, well, any other questions for for, uh, for any of us? But certainly, I, I know you really like to hear how their experience is like. On behalf of the college, I thank you. Steve's gone, so I'm going to draw this to a close. Yeah, thank you. Thank well, you very much.